My name is Mark Bremer. I am president of the St. Louis Lawyers Chapter of the Federalist Society. Before I introduce our distinguished moderator, uh, as to CLE, I'm told you should scan this on the back of your program to indicate your attendance here. And I do know that if you're applying for Missouri CLE credit, you can get on their website, and as of this date, it will list all of the accredited programs. And the, the, these programs for Missouri, uh, uh, the sponsor is our St. Louis Lawyers Chapter of the Federalist Society. Just click on those, and it will automatically go into your application, as I understand it. It is my distinct honor to introduce the moderator for this panel today, Judge Stephen Limbaugh, Jr. Judge Limbaugh served as a judge on the Missouri Supreme Court, where he ultimately also served as its Chief Justice. In 2008, he was nominated by President George W. Bush and confirmed by the Senate to be a judge on the United States District Court for the Eastern District of Missouri. Uh, where he curr currently serves as a senior judge. Throughout his career, Judge Limbaugh has participated in numerous professional organizations and has been the recipient of numerous professional awards as outlined in his bio. He told me to be brief, and I'm going to honor that, but check out his bio on the, the website event page. Of particular interest to this conference, and this is not on his bio, is that he has had a lifelong interest in the study of history. He is past president and permanent trustee of the Missouri State Historical Society. He is a member of the Missouri Bicentennial Commission, uh, which has been celebrating Missouri's 200 years of statehood. He is a member of the Board of Directors of the Ulysses S. Grant Trail Association, is that correct, Judge? Yes, sir. Which is in the process of mapping General Grant's military campaigns during the Civil War. And that is a group of Civil War history buffs. So you've got one here today. Judge Limbaugh comes from a family that many of us in Missouri consider to be the most st a stellar generational line of lawyers and judges. His grandfather was Rush Limbaugh Sr., who founded the family firm in Cape Girardeau and who continued actively in the practice of law beyond the age of 100, and he was a a very instrumental leader in the Missouri Bar and very highly regarded. His father, Stephen Limbaugh Sr., is sitting right there. He will not raise his head probably. He's a, a very modest man. Uh, he, I think, is following in his father's footsteps and is actively engaged in the practice of law at the Limbaugh Law Firm in Cape Girardeau in his mid-90s. And he told me, though, last night that he has stopped working Saturdays and Sundays. <laughs> For the fourth generation of Limbaugh's present here today, I think I saw Judge Chris. Is he? There he is back there. This is Judge Steve Limbaugh Jr.'s son. who is a, a judge of the circuit court in Cole County, Missouri, which is Missouri's version of the DC circuit because Cole County is the seat of government uh, in the state of Missouri. Judges Limbaugh Jr. and Sr. have been very active in our Federalist Society chapter. Uh, they, for many years, they are both continuing to serve on our advisory board for the chapter. Without further ado, I give you a good friend of the Federalist Society and of many of us in this room, Judge Stephen Limbaugh, Jr. Is that good? Thank you, Mark. Uh, that was too much. 
uh, too many Limbaugh's. <laughs> Dad is 94, and I think he's going to live to be 150. <laughs> so, uh, let me begin with an aside. Two weeks before Abraham Lincoln's 200th birthday, Marsha, my wife, and I made a, uh, a uh, trip here to visit the Lincoln Museum. We stayed overnight at a bed and breakfast and spent the day in the museum. It was two weeks before his 200th birthday when all the crowds would come, so we had the place to ourselves almost. Uh, we, we toured all day long, and I have to say, it was an emotional experience. By the time we finished the tour, I, I was moved to tears almost. I hope all of you will go on this tour. There's a little personal aspect to it as well. Um, Mark told you that I'm from Cape Girardeau, Missouri. Now, the museum is arranged so that the first exhibit is Abraham Lincoln's original home, an exact replica of it, and a living farm kind of thing. It's very interesting. The next exhibit you'll go to is about slavery, and it is a humongous uh, account of the horrors and the abomination of slavery as Lincoln was uh, growing up and going into adulthood and resulted in the Civil War. So anyway, Marsha and I go to the next exhibit, and immediately on the left is the striking poster. Here is a replica. Great sale of real estate and slaves. The undersigned marshal of the city of Cape Girardeau is pursuing an order of the Court of Common Pleas to sell to the highest bidder and so forth and so on, listing 26 people, Alec Nelson, Sam Anderson, Leda Hope, and so forth, ages 50 to ages one. November 6, 1855. And I turned to Marsha. Marsha, Marsha, don't tell anyone where we're from. <laughs> now to the cancel, cancel culture. We could speak all day long to the issues that have been raised in, in the cancel culture. Or the billing that we had from the, um, from the uh, description uh, of the uh, program is that uh, we were talking about efforts to remove from cider, to hold accountable historical and contemporary figures, everybody from Columbus and George Washington to, to even Abraham Lincoln and Ulysses S. Grant. Uh, we decided not to go into that exact uh, aspect or manifestation of the cancel culture. But I will mention two short personal uh, events. Most of you have had some kind of uh, personal uh, experience or account with cancel culture in your communities or whatever. That happened in Cape Girardeau two years ago when the Confederate monument was removed. The city council voted to remove it. The United Daughters of the Confederacy came and got it. It's someplace in a storage uh, facility outside of St. Louis where it won't get destroyed or desecrated. The fact is that, yes, the monument could be stand for uh, what some people think is a, a uh, honor to slavery and white supremacy and maybe recalling the lost cause and so forth. It was erected in 1931, though, and the people on the city council didn't avail themselves of the history of the monument, which was that it was erected as a reconciliation of both sides in our community. And it was a great event when the celebration occurred, the newspaper said it was one of the greatest events ever to occur in the community because the North and the South side people, they came together. Uh, the bands played, the, the speeches were made. None of that was taken into account when the decision was made to remove the monument. In contrast, the University of Missouri flagship school is at Columbia, Missouri. There is a huge statue of Thomas Jefferson there. Uh, the same kind of vocal minority that came to the city council in Cape Girardeau came to the board of curators in Columbia, Missouri, demanding that this statue of Thomas Jefferson be removed. The president of the university asked a blue ribbon committee to 
make recommendations on what to do. They came back saying, let's have signage on this monument, of Thomas Jefferson, this, this statue, so that we can explain the context, that he was a slaveholder and a bad guy in that sense, but otherwise he did some good things. So that was given to the Board of Curators. They voted that down five to two, saying that we don't want anything next to Thomas Jefferson because Jefferson speaks for himself. So the cancel culture lost that one. They won in Cape Girardeau. Uh, now, what the, the, the uh, panelists decided to do, since we can't cover all the manifestations of cancel culture, is to take each uh, of their individual specialties and interests. And so we'll do that by uh, Professor Strawson is going to address cancel culture in academia and especially the law schools. Professor Anders Walker will address uh, cancel culture in big tech. And then Jonathan Urich, who's in the middle here, he will address cancel culture of law lawyer shaming, which should be a particular interest to this audience. Let me uh, then introduce each of these people more properly. John Urick is in the middle here, is the Association Chief Counsel of the United States Chamber of Commerce Litigation Center. He was, uh, he is a uh, undergraduate degree in economics from the University of Delaware. I suppose that's your only connection to the President Biden, is that right? That's <laughs> he later, he later uh, graduated Order Coy from the University of Virginia Law School and was on the Law Review, of, of course. And then he served as a law clerk to Judge Jeffrey Sutton of the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Sixth Circuit. And later, he was a uh, law clerk for Justice Scalia. That was the year, I believe, that Justice Scalia died in office. And to accommodate John, uh, Justice Thomas took him in to finish his term as a law clerk at the Supreme Court. After that, uh, John's been involved in all sorts of litigation, uh, mostly on behalf of the United States Chamber of Commerce. Uh, he's also written quite a few articles. He writes for uh, Real Clear Politics, for Yahoo News, for um, uh, National Review, and so forth. Uh, I've looked at some of his articles. They have very uh, intriguing titles, like First, the Federalist Society stood by the law, not Trump. Here's another. The conservative case for class actions doesn't pass the smell test. So anyway, Jonathan, we're glad you're here. They had trouble getting here last night. So now I'll go to Anders Walker. He's a, the Lily Myers Professor of Law and Professor of History by courtesy. What, what is that kind of a academia convention to say by courtesy? Why don't they just say you're a professor? That means I don't get paid. Oh, I didn't know. I didn't know. I didn't know. In, in any, then you're the one who's courteous. Yes. <laughs> and that's what I think. <laughs> yes. Well, anyway, he, he uh, is education, BA at Wesleyan University. He has both his law degree and it, from Duke, as well as a master's degree in history. And then he has a PhD in history at Yale University. So he's been uh, at St. Louis University Law School for... Um, 16, 17 years now, he teaches constitutional law, criminal law, criminal procedure, and American legal history. Now, he is an absolutely prolific writer and author. Uh, he has written uh, uh, two latest books, are The Ghost of Jim Crow, How Southern Moder Moderates Use Brown versus Board of Education to Stall Civil Rights, published by Oxford, Oxford University. And then another, The Burning House, Jim Crow and the Making of Modern America, published by Yale University Press. Um, he has a CV that I looked at. He has already more than 50 published scholarly articles. And it, he's just an amazing scholar. But I tell you what impressed me the most. He won the Favorite Teacher Award seven times at the law school. 2009, 2011, 18, 19, 20, and so forth. Uh, that's Anders. Now, the next person on my left is Professor A.S. <laughs> easy, easy. <laughs> is Professor Nadine Strassen. 
Uh, she came from New York. She is really a, a luminary. Uh, she's the John Marshall Harlan, the second professor of law emerita at New York Law School. She started Harvard undergrad, Harvard Law School, editor of the law, Harvard Law Review. She worked in private practice in um, Minneapolis and New York for about nine years or so, and then she went to academia to be a professor at New York Law School. In 1991, she was hired by the American Civil Liberties also Union. Also a courtesy appointment. <laughs> oh, gee, I didn't know. I didn't know. She was appointed, not hired, to be president of the American Civil Liberties Union. She did that for 17 years until 2008, at which time she went back into academia. She also serves on, uh, still serves on the advisory board of the ACLU, but also for the Foundation for Individual Rights and in Education, uh, for Electronic Privacy Information Center, for the National Coalition Against Censorship. Uh, it should tell you something, too, that she was is so well thought of and so uh, ecumenical in her appeal that when she resigned from the ACU as president after 17 years, there was a big tribute banquet. And who should show up? Okay, well, who should show up but Ruth Bader Ginsburg, David Souter, and yes, Antonin Scalia to honor her. <laughs> now, she has... She has a multitude of awards and honors. Uh, go on Google her or go on Wikipedia and you can get it all there. But it's just an amazing uh, resume that she has. Also, she has made literally thousands of speeches and public presentations before diverse audiences, including more than the speeches on more than 500 college and university campuses. What an amazing effort that you've made on behalf of free speech. Yeah, so um, good grief. Professor Strassen is also a member of the Council on Foreign Relations. My goodness, that, that's just wonderful. But here, for our purposes, suffice it to say that she is a free speech ad advocate if there ever was one. With that, I'll call on John Urich. Thank you, Judge Limbaugh. And it's great to be here. Uh, it was touch and go there for a little bit. Um, I shared a three-hour Uber with Professor Strassen last night from Chicago when our connecting flight was canceled. So I am very happy to be here. The prompt for this panel is, should we cancel Lincoln? And I'd like to approach that question and the current implications of that question from the perspective of Lincoln's career as an attorney. And Abraham Lincoln represented all sorts of clients during his legal career in, here in Illinois. He pursued goals for clients that he personally opposed, like divorce, for example. He advocated for black clients. And on the other hand, he occasionally represented clients that were adverse to free blacks and slaves, even though he abhorred slavery. Should we cancel Lincoln, or any lawyer for that matter, for representing unpopular clients? Throughout American history, I think there's been a fairly widespread but hardly unbroken consensus, both within and outside the, the legal community, that lawyers shouldn't be shamed or punished for representing unpopular or even despicable clients. And I think today, this norm is clearly reflect, reflected in ABA model rule of professional conduct 1.2b, adopted in 1983. I promise this is the only portion of my remarks where I will quote a statute or rule. It says, a lawyer's representation of a client, including representation by appointment, does not constitute an endorsement of the client's political, economic, social, or moral views or activities. And the associated commentary with the, that rule says, legal representation should not be denied to people whose cause is controversial or the subject of popular disapproval. And nearly every state in the union follows some version of Model Rule 1.2b, including Illinois, which adopts it wholesale. And this strong norm against lawyer shaming, I think, in our history goes back at least as far as John Adams' famous 1770 representation of the British Redcoats accused of murdering American patriots in the Boston Massacre. Now, to be sure, the norm has been tested from time to time throughout our American history, and it has failed at times. You know, Adams' representation itself was wildly unpopular at the time, and his law firm suffered dearly for it. 
but Americans quickly came to regard that episode as one of Adams' finest hours, and I think we generally agree that his example was incredibly brave and is one that uh, represents the very best of our legal tradition and a, is a model to be emulated by attorneys. And so in line with the example set by John Adams, American lawyers have a very long and celebrated tradition of representing deeply unpopular clients. American military lawyers represented Axis war criminals during and after World War II. The ACLU has represented neo-Nazis and other white supremacists in free speech litigation. And of course, public defenders and other criminal defense attorneys represent criminal defendants accused of committing heinous crimes every single day. All these representations are honorable and represent the best, in my view, of the American legal tradition. But as with the John Adams episode, we occasionally forget the norm against lawyer shaming and against equating lawyers with their clients. You know, for example, during the McCarthy era, lawyers that represented communists were shamed and targeted and punished for those representations, and so were civil rights era lawyers. And these incidents, though, were not the legal professions or our society's finest hours by any stretch. And while we have had these unfortunate episodes, you know, where the norm broke down, we've generally recognized that that was a failure of this important norm and the pendulum has swung back and we've recommitted ourselves to the norm against lawyer shaming. Unfortunately, I think that norm is being tested and is under assault once again in our country. And over the last decade or so, the consensus against shaming lawyers for representing unpopular clients is unfortunately starting to crack and crumble. And I think that trend is deeply unfortunate and very dangerous for our legal system. I think it's harmful not just for the lawyers that are you know, the targets of shaming, but I think it's bad for clients. I think it's bad for courts that depend on quality advocacy to get the law and the facts right. And I think it's ultimately bad for the rule of law itself. And of course, we all suffer when the rule of law suffers because we rely on it for our own protection. So in my view, lawyer shaming, and I'll define that with a little more precision soon, is nothing less than an attempt to influence the content of the law and the outcome of specific cases outside the appropriate political channels and our adversarial system. And we have to respect the unique role of lawyers in that system and tolerate respectful disagreement, not just about the content of the law, but this is key, but also tolerance about disagreement regarding the potential moral complicity of lawyers in their clients' goals. Our legal system depends on such tolerance because lawyers like Americans at large are an extremely diverse group of people with incredibly diverse views. And that lawyers cannot serve their unique role in our system without tolerating such disagreement. So what do I mean exactly by lawyer shaming? And so here's kind of my rough working definition. Lawyer shaming is criticizing and most importantly, shunning, ostracizing, harassing, or punishing lawyers through social or economic means or otherwise, for representing unpopular clients of any kind. And whatever the reason that makes the client unpopular, that you could be a criminal defendant, a speaker with an unpopular message, a large corporation, <coughs> a religious person seeking an accommodation for their beliefs, even a government body like the Trump administration or the House of Representatives standing in to defend a statute, or a state seeking to defend its criminal judgments. In other words, lawyer shaming is treating lawyers as not respectable attorneys merely because of their choice of clients, you know, treating certain representations as simply beyond the pale. Now, it's important though to distinguish this from I think other ways of criticizing lawyers and clients that are not lawyer shaming and don't present the same sort of risk to our system. They may not be great for our politics and our society, but they're not lawyer shaming. So first, Criticizing lawyers for breaching the rules of legal ethics, you know, and the rules that govern how lawyers, in, you know, represent their clients is not lawyer shaming. So there's, you know, rules, things like Rule 11 and their state analogs, rules against lying to the court, stuff like that. Criticize away lawyers for, for engaging in that sort of behavior, um, making frivolous arguments, that kind of thing. Quite the contrary, actually, those sorts of rules are absolutely essential to the court's function and the adversarial system's function in furthering the rule of law. Also criticizing the arguments themselves is as bad or extremely bad as not, as not lawyer shaming. That's what we do. As long as it's not directed at the lawyer, it's directed at the argument. And same thing about clients, criticizing or shunning parties for 
the, the, the legal actions that they take, even pursuing legal rights that they have that we may regard as immoral. That's not lawyer shaming. That may be bad for other reasons of cancel culture. I'm not defending cancel culture, but that's not lawyer shaming. And finally, having lawyers having personal moral qualms about representing particular clients isn't lawyer shaming either. Generally speaking, American lawyers have no obligation to accept particular clients, so I think it's perfectly fine to avoid representing certain clients um, or even to regard such representation as morally complicit. For example, I could totally understand a Catholic lawyer might not prefer to represent a woman seeking an abortion or a state seeking to impose the death penalty because in their view, it might make them morally complicit with those goals. But the issue is not all lawyers share such moral qualms. And so the, the issue then becomes professional and social tolerance for disagreement about such moral complicity. The problem becomes ostracizing or attempting to punish other lawyers who don't share our, those particular moral qualms and treating them as dishonorable or not respectable members of the legal profession. In my view, lawyer shaming is fundamentally about such social and professional intolerance rather than mere, merely moral disagreement and debate or disagreement about specific <coughs> legal propositions. And so up until 2011, I think our society and legal culture remained in a period where we were fairly committed to this, this historic norm against lawyer shaming. And we adhered to that principle that it's wrong to shame lawyers for representing unpopular clients. And we saw this in in two incidents in 2007 and 2010 of swift bipartisan backlash against attempts by conservatives to shame lawyers representing Guantanamo detainees. It was a widespread bipartisan condemnation of such criticisms. But I think cracks in the consensus against lawyer shaming started to emerge in 2011 when Paul Clement agreed to represent the U.S. House of Representatives in its defense of DOMA, the Defense of Marriage Act, after the Obama administration refused to defend that statute in court. And in response, the Human Rights Campaign, which is perhaps the premier gay rights organization in the country, launched a pressure campaign, a public pressure campaign against Paul Clement's firm and the firm's other clients trying to get the firm to drop the house as a client. But even at that time, the reaction to this pressure campaign was fairly negative on both the right and the left, remarkably. So for example, the editorial boards of both the Washington Post and the New York Times condemned this pressure campaign as bullying, violating the core principle that the, the rule of law benefits from able, able advocates on both sides of every case, including really controversial ones. But unfortunately, since 2011, I think uh, lawyer shaming is on the rise, and I just wanna give you a few examples. So in 2019, 20, and 21, Law students at several elite schools staged climate change protests against large law firms for representing fossil fuel companies, and they disrupted recruiting events and encouraged students not to go to those law firms. And these protests actually led to the formation of a new student group called Law Students for Climate Accountability, which grades law firms in an attempt to shame them based on how much work they do for the fossil fuel industry. And this group, not only targets the firms, it targets their other non-fossil fuel clients in an attempt to get them, the firms, to drop the, the fossil fuel clients. Another example is in 2019, Harvard law professor Ronald Sullivan was removed as faculty dean of an undergrad dorm after students criticized his decision to represent Harvey Weinstein. And th this incident was pretty remarkable because I don't think anybody could accuse Ron Sullivan of not being a progressive. He has extremely strong progressive credentials, but um, he was, the students at Harvard declared that his representation of Harvey Weinstein made them feel unsafe, and Professor Sullivan was verbally abused and his home was vandalized. And he was the first African-American uh, dean in the whole mm -hmm. history of Harvard, which goes back to the 17th century. Exactly. It was quite remarkable. Um, last year, Canon Shamagam and his team at Paul, Paul Weiss were shamed for representing the state of Oklahoma on a cert petition in a capital case about the, the implications of the Supreme Court's McGirt decision. Shockingly, many elite lawyers on social media rapidly lined up to shame Cannon and his team for helping Oklahoma defend their criminal judgment in a death penalty case, but some critics even argued that competing law firms should use that representation against Paul Weiss to distinguish their own firms saying, you know, we don't try to kill people like Paul Weiss does. 
This is dangerous lawyer shaming, I think, and a blatant violation of the professional norm reflected in Model Rule 1.2, that we don't equate lawyers with the goals of their clients. Perhaps the most egregious recent example, however, of harmful lawyer shaming is the Lincoln Project's social media campaign targeting Jones Day and Porter Wright for representing President Trump and the GOP in Pennsylvania election litigation. Now, I want to be very precise here. Neither of those firms were involved in any litigation alleging election fraud. They were raising different claims. The Lincoln Project nevertheless accused the two firms of undermining our democracy and encouraged the firm's employees to resign in protest. They even doxed two Porter Wright attorneys and posted their contact information on social media, subjecting those attorneys to tons of harassment. And they promised to launch a full-blown TV and digital ad campaign shaming the firms and their clients. But as far as I can tell, the Lincoln Project never uh, followed through on that last threat. But uh, liberal legal commentators shamed lawyers at Jones Day who raised constitutional arguments based on the independent state legislature doctrine. I won't go into full detail about what that is, but, um, but most importantly, this doctrine has been endorsed by four current justices on the Supreme Court, and in truth, six, two former justices, Chief Justice Rehnquist and Justice Scalia, also endorsed this doctrine. And so there's just no way you can fairly criticize Jones Day's constitutional arguments as somehow frivolous or unethical. You might not like them, but they're, not be they're hardly beyond the pale. And a a another liberal law professor has explicitly called on lawyers to shun fellow attorneys representing President Trump or, or serving in his administration and to block their professional advancement. And most recently, unfortunately, conservatives criticized Supreme Court nominee Ketanji Brown Jackson for her prior work as a public defender. I think that was unfortunate and crossed the line into harmful lawyer shaming. Very yeah. So why is this breakdown in this norm so harmful? Well, I think for starters, the, the less important reason this is so harmful is that it encourages, it drives a wedge in the lawyer-client relationship and incentivizes lawyers to commit ethical violations. For example, it encourages lawyers that come under pressure to drop clients midstream, which prejudices them. And I think it also may encourage lawyers to publicly justify their representations by either improperly revealing confidential information that makes their clients seem more sympathetic than they otherwise might, or on the other hand, by dis publicly distancing themselves from their clients you know, and, and condemning them to, to create some space. Not, both of those things, in my view, are ethical violations. And even if lawyer shaming doesn't actually require these ethical violations, it certainly encourages it and may lead to more. But uh, much more importantly, though, if the tolerance norm collapses, I think our adversarial system, as I said earlier, just can't achieve its, its critical roles as a limited purpose institution. So again, in an extremely diverse society as ours, we've, with lots of different you know, views and many heated disagreements, I think you know, we've channeled those disagreements into the political process and the laws that we have, and then the adversarial system, which is supposed to adjudicate impartially disputes that arise under the pre-existing rules. So our system and the legal profession are, are, are essential limited purpose institutions that serve that goal of the rule of law. But without tolerance for, for lawyers that disagree, again, not merely tolerance about different legal positions, but tolerance about the moral complicity of lawyers in their clients' goals, we, you know, lawyers can't serve that goal of preserving the rule of law. And again, it doesn't, the argument doesn't work that if you say, oh, well, you know, this particular lawyer, I can shame them because they don't need to represent this client. Someone else will step in. Well, well that argument actually only works if the general norm holds, right? So if we want to accommodate lawyers that have moral qualms about representing certain clients, then we, we have to uh, adhere to the general norm against lawyer shaming. And the legal profession alone has the technical expertise to serve the function of the adversarial system to, get the, to help courts get the law right and to correctly apply it. We need the best, highest quality legal advocates in cases. So I think you know, the mechanism of how lawyer shaming connects with and undermines the rule of law I think is fairly straightforward. It reduces the availability of effective counsel. It makes it harder for courts to do their job and get the law and the facts right. And it makes it harder for clients to get due process of law. And, and 
lawyer shaming, like I said earlier, also undermines the equal benefits of the rule of law for all of us. Courts don't decide cases, as we all know, based on the popularity of particular parties. That's not how they write opinions. That's not how they apply rules of law. They decide cases based on general legal principles. And one day those principles may benefit a deeply unpopular, despicable client, but the next day you or me or someone else, some other controversial client, less controversial client may need those very same principles to protect their own rights. And free speech and the historic work of the ACLU are probably the best example of this, where law made in cases involving despicable speech has turned out to benefit the, the speech of everyone. And finally, um, lawyer shaming, believe it or not, actually harms the rule of law precisely when you have concerns about a client's commitment to the rule of law. So say, let's just assume you may have concerns about the Trump administration's commitment to the rule of law, right? Shaming lawyers for, good lawyers, for serving in the Trump administration and doing their duty will, will do the exact opposite and, and just you know, make it more difficult to hold the Trump administration to account or any administration or client, private client or public client or otherwise, to, to, to ensure that they adhere to the rule of law. Uh, it'll just end up discouraging good lawyers of integrity from public service. So for all these reasons, I think the ultimate result of lawyer shaming is less conformity to the rule of law, not more. Thank you. John, John that calls to mind uh, what I read about the David Boys law firm, who is also representing mm -hmm. Harvey Weinstein, when he agreed to represent Harvey, several of the progressive associates flat out quit the firm. Yeah. So anyway, uh, Anders Walker's next. <clears throat> yeah. <laughs> Should the land of Lincoln cancel Lincoln? No. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, here we <laughs> But if Lincoln is canceled, it won't be the state of Illinois that does it. It'll be average people, probably young people. Turn the mic up, will you? That's better. Yeah. <clears throat> if Lincoln is canceled, it won't be the state of Illinois that does it. It'll be average people, probably young people, on social media. The idea of canceling someone first appeared in a song by a band called Chic in 1981, titled, Your Love is Canceled. The term appeared again in the film New Jack City in 1991, when mob boss Nino Brown, played by Wesley Snipes, ordered an underling to cancel a woman, i.e. kill her. A line that African-American rapper Curtis James, or 50 Cent, repeated in his 2005 hit, Hustler's Ambition, and rapper Lil Wayne repeated in his tune, I'm Single. The term cancel culture first entered popular parlance in 2018 after a flurry of celebrities were outed on social media for perceived bad behavior. J.K. Rowling was canceled for mocking the term people who menstruate. She still believes in men and women. Kanye West was canceled for saying that slavery was a choice, and then he was canceled again for supporting Trump and wearing a MAGA hat, and then he ran for president, and then he was finally canceled. <laughs> but now he's back. That's true. So you can be canceled, but you can come back. <clears throat> There's hope. Shania Twain was canceled for saying that she would have voted for Trump were she not Canadian. Corporations that we're not simply social media platforms. So one of my themes today is cancel culture is coming partly out of corporate culture. Corporations and universities, which historically have gone hand in hand, are promoting cancel culture in non-obvious ways. Corporations that were not simply social media platforms. So it's happening on social media because average people are able through the hashtag uh, device to attract attention to certain themes. And so hashtags uh, really became a way to draw attention to people for perceived bad behavior. And it was hashtag cancel that became one of the tools that people could use. And this, of course, generates revenue for the social media platforms, 
partly through advertising. If you get enough followers, then you get money. And so there's a lot of money uh, involved in allowing people to use these social media platforms. They're also data mining companies. They're using information that we provide them for free. But corporations that are not simply social media companies have also gotten in on this. In 2017, NBC News canceled Matt Lauer after a female employee of the company reported that Lauer had sexually assaulted her at the 2014 Winter Olympics in Sochi. Lauer claimed it was consensual, but by that time, he had been escorted out of the building. That same year, Google fired an engineer for distributing a 10-page memo arguing that men were biologically predisposed for technology-related jobs, while women were not. He probably should have stuck to engineering, not writing. He lost his job over that memorandum. And last year, Dr. Seuss Enterprises canceled Dr. Seuss. <laughs> Specifically, his books, quote, if I ran the zoo, and McGilligot's Pool, for propagating racist, racist stereotypes. Why? Why are we seeing this flurry of action now? This is all relatively recent. If you think about 2018, it was just yesterday in historical terms. Corporations, including social media platforms, are making money. In a recent article for Forbes, Kian Bakhtari wrote, 64% of consumers will buy or boycott a brand solely because of its position on a social or political issue. Only a few years ago, the term boycott was viewed as something confined to the radical fringes of society. Today, boycotting has become a mainstream consumer reaction that's facilitated by social media. So social media has transformed American life in a lot of ways. It's transformed the way we communicate with each other, and it's transformed the business landscape as well. It's not only directed towards socially irresponsible brands, but also towards brands seen to be overplaying their social and environmental credentials. So business now is starting to adopt political positions as a type of branding, and this too is designed to make money. <clears throat> but it, some companies have gone over the top. I don't know if you remember the Kendall Jenner Pepsi ad where she tried to portray herself as a protester, uh, I think in 2020, and the public didn't buy it. Swedish vegan milk brand Oatly has long been a favorite of eco-friendly consumers. However, fans of the alternative milk brand have started boycotting the company after it sold 200 million shares to a consortium that includes Blackstone following a Twitter thread accusing the investor of contributing to deforestation in the Amazon. And this goes, I think, to the lawyer scene. If you're affiliated in any way with something that the consumer doesn't like, like deforestation in the Amazon, well, then you could be canceled, even though you're pretending to be eco-friendly. <laughs> and the term for this is virtue signaling, which is we're going to signal that we have some type of moral position when, in fact, we're just selling sneakers. That was Nike's Colin Kaepernick campaign. Do they really care about Colin Kaepernick? Probably not. <clears throat> Similarly, Lululemon has been under fire for promoting an event about resisting capitalism. <laughs> despite, <laughs> despite the company's $45 billion market valuation. I think that's deceptive advertising. <laughs> Come on, kids. We're going to resist capitalism. <laughs> By the way, buy some shorts. <clears throat> but consumers are going for this. And a sucker's born every minute. And so this is generating a lot of money. And so business is getting in on this. And no business in this country wants to be branded as offensive or inconsiderate or, even worse, racist, sexist. <clears throat> That's very bad for business. Consumers, in this sense, are pressing corporations to become more inclusive, more diverse, more woke. Consumers themselves are also becoming more diverse. <clears throat> Personally, I think this is what's going on, is that the, the market is driving this. It's not just uh, kids who are reading stuff online. It's demographics. 
America is rapidly becoming more multicultural, multilingual, and multiracial. To appeal to such a diverse demographic, companies need to be wary of marketing campaigns or corporate messaging that is de demeaning, condescending, or insulting. If, <clears throat> if you're selling widgets, you don't want to just appeal to your white Anglo-Saxon Protestant audience. You want to appeal to as many people as you possibly can, and that means appealing in a non-offensive, inclusive way so that you can sell your product. <clears throat> the more inclusive the messaging, the bigger the market share. The same goes for talent. American business is drawing talent from around the world, particularly in the tech industry. And making racist or otherwise offensive comments in the boardroom is likely to drive talent away. The tech industry is also heavily reliant on creatives, and creatives are by definition untraditional. And so to attract creatives to your business, you have to pitch a particular environment, a particular corporate image. <clears throat> otherwise, you're not going to get that creativity. In an article that has generated considerable interest, New York Times columnist Ross Douthit posits a deeper connection between corporate America and cancel culture. According to Douthit, a certain kind of virtue signaling on progressive social causes, a performative wokeness, offered to liberalism and the activists left preemptively in the hopes that having corporate America take their side in the culture wars will blunt efforts to tax or regulate business. So the idea here is to get the progressive left on board with business so that the progressive left, left start, stops targeting business. I don't know if you remember Elizabeth Warren, but she was starting to talk about we don't need billionaires. Well, that might be a reason to <clears throat> go woke. That's why Jack Dorsey's doing yoga and <laughs> paying Ibram X. Kendi $9 million so that he doesn't get called out or canceled. And so Douthat thinks this is a survival strategy for business. This is the way to make it through these treacherous waters. Douthat draws an analogy to the deal that business struck with FDR during the New Deal, another moment in American history where business was on the ropes. Corporations at that time reconciled themselves to many of FDR's programs, even though many of them were quite left-leading. They reconciled themselves to a family wage and a certain modesty in how upper echelons were paid and how conspicuously they consumed. And this was an effort to defend capitalism. FDR was not a socialist. The story is he was actually someone who outsmarted the socialists because there were communists in the United States at the time. They were hoping during the Great Depression, business would finally fail and the revolution would arrive, but F FDR outsmarted them with his programs that to this day are quite popular, popular, the SEC, the FDIC, Social Security, and so on, and all of that saved capitalism. And doubt that saying something similar is going on today. And American capitalism is incredibly creative, dynamic, and adaptive, and that's why it's so successful. It can, <clears throat> it can navigate these political waters very effectively and it can actually determine political outcomes. And part of that is fooling consumers, and part of it is changing messaging, narratives, and so we're getting a different tone at the corporate level in America today, and that's probably a good thing. Driving this argues doubt that it's a timeless imperative. What am I required to do to make money unmolested by the government? This makes some sense. What ultimately must all of us do to make money? Joseph Schumpeter, uh, an economist who was at the University of Chicago, argued that capitalism by, by its very nature does this kind of thing. It relies on the destruction of existing technologies, existing modes of thinking, existing cultural norms in order to make room for new technologies. Remember Blockbuster? We used to all go to Blockbuster on Friday to rent videos. And it was like a, a fun night. <laughs> well, where's Blockbuster today? It's gone. With streaming online platforms like Netflix, there's no need for Blockbuster anymore. That's creative destruction, according to Schumpeter. 
New technologies create new markets and new opportunities for growth. Imagine if you're in the lipstick business. How many types of lipstick can you make? Not many, but what if men wear lipstick? Wow, that's like double the market. How about a little eyeshadow? A little blush. I could use a little blush. That's big money. Let's, let's rethink gender. Have you seen Harry Styles on the cover of Vogue? This is an English singer. Now he's wearing a dress. Imagine the possibilities for the market. It's double the number of dresses you can sell, plus all the male makeup. New technologies create new markets and new opportunities for growth. However, they leave destruction behind. Schumpeter termed this the gale of creative destruction that sweeps across capitalism. It's why it's successful. It is adaptive. It is creative. It is dynamic. He argued it's what distinguishes free enterprise systems from state-run systems, which are backward-looking. And it is what makes free enterprise systems more dynamic, more competitive, and in the aggregate, more likely to yield a higher standard of living for more people than command economies. Case in point, look at Russia today. They are in free fall. And Vladimir Putin, although he has quoted J.K. Rowling saying he's being canceled, he's canceling himself. And it is horrible to watch, these poor people in Ukraine. But I think America has regained its purpose and mission. We are a beacon on a hill of a free society. And that's what Ukraine wants. We've already won. Now we just have to watch this sad thing play out. Going back to Douthat, we see this in American history. The decline of manufacturing wrought a wave of destruction through the American Midwest. St. Louis is a testament to this. Detroit, Gary even as it opened the door for a new technology-based economy on the coasts. Before that, the rise of industrial capitalism wrought a wave of destruction through the American South, a campaign that Abraham Lincoln presided over during the Civil War. Happy to leave slavery intact in states that remained with the Union, Missouri, Kentucky, Maryland, Lincoln rejected the South's bid for autonomy, understanding that it would destroy the nation. The nation, thanks to the Constitution and the court, had developed two forms of capitalism by 1860, one rooted in the agrarian economics of slavery and the other rooted in the industrial economics of free enterprise. By 1860, the free enterprise system was outproducing slavery 10 to 1. Lincoln, one might say, canceled the South. Now, I've got to plug my next book on Andrew Jackson here. The South was a cancel culture. The South was a very violent place before the Civil War. If you insulted Andrew Jackson, if you said anything about Rachel Robards, Jackson would put a bullet in you. The fact that someone could put a bullet in you policed what people said around Andrew Jackson. Everyone was very careful not to offend old Hickory. Someone on social media can put a bullet in any one of us. They can ruin our careers, they can ruin our reputations, and that's going to police the way we communicate. Flannery O'Connor wrote that that is the origin of Southern manners. The South developed a system of manners because it was a culture of honor, and cultures of honor are cultures of violence. If you can be canceled with a bullet, you are going to be very careful not to offend anyone. Let me in there. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Anders. That's e excellent. Now, I want to commend to you all of the articles that the speakers have submitted. I think that you can find them online on the website. Uh, the Tyranny of Big Tech, uh, the Takeover of America's Legal System, The Rise of Woke Capital, Lawyers' Democratic Dysfunction, John Adams' Legal Representation, The Cancel Culture, Lawyer Shaming, and here's one of the best. Resisting Cancel Culture by one Nadine Strassen. So with that, Professor, you may proceed. Thank you so Thank much, you. Your Honor. Uh, I'm delighted to be able to, oh, sorry. Does that work? Oh, yes. Great. So thank you for unleashing my voice. I am delighted to be here. 
I saw that uh, Judge James Ho was here earlier. Yeah. I assume he's not here anymore. But uh, on this theme, I really wanted to salute and thank him for a phenomenal presentation he gave spontaneously at Georgetown Law School this year after a cancellation, which is still ongoing, against Ilya Shapiro, formerly of the Cato Institute. Uh, Judge Ho was supposed to talk about originalism. He showed up, and he just gave a courageous, I'm sorry, it has to take courage to speak against cancellation, against censorship for academic freedom, but it does take courage. And uh, that was absolutely a, a thrilling speech to me. I had interceded with, unsuccessfully uh, with the dean on Ilya's behalf, and I've written also about the, the larger issues. So uh, I wanted to um, commend and thank him for that. As, as always, I'm uh, delighted to address this convention along with uh, just innumerable Federalist Society forums that I've addressed ever since you were founded, uh, before many of you were even born. It would be, uh, it would be a waste of my time. Oh, are you a member, actually? <laughs> no, I'm not. Could, I, I would like to, to give you a, guest, a gift membership for me. <laughs> <laughs> That's so interesting. But I actually think it's more potent for me to be able to say I have never been a card-carrying member of the Federalist Society. <laughs> and. Nonetheless, in fact, therefore, I cherish every opportunity to speak. You are inviting an outsider persistently uh, to challenge and to agree on some points and disagree on others. And that's been the mission of the Federalist Society since the beginning. And it epitomizes everything that cancel culture is not. And I have just been try accepting more and more FedSoc invitations because FedSoc itself is being canceled more and more. I don't know if you're aware of that, but my being on the, you know, so they, um, I'll, I'll get to that later on. But I want to start by, uh, you know, I'm not just only going to praise you, uh, <laughs> it, it, but I want to say it would be a waste of my time only to preach to the converted. So I would be happy to speak to FedSoc audiences, even if you did conform to the caricatures that we've heard from too many politicians and pundits, not to mention from too many professors and students, which has led to record-breaking cancellation campaigns um, against this organization. Um, but before I, 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 I focus on the campus or higher educational aspect, uh, I want to put my remarks in a broader context. Number one, I want to stress that I continue to defend FedSoc against the increasing attacks, not only because I defend freedom even for the proverbial thought that we hate, to quote Oliver Wendell Holmes, um, but even beyond that neutral free speech stance, I also wholeheartedly endorse some of your key Founding principles. Uh, so here, I can be a part. Here, here. I can be a part. Well, wait. You, you 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 might be shocked at one of those. What some of those principles are. You know, they could come straight from the ACLU policy guide. One of your longtime active members, who's a friend and colleague of mine, UCLA law professor Eugene Volick, uh, once said, I'd wager that most FedSoc members have never read this statement or read it once but have long ago forgotten it. So let me remind you, as I do every time I speak to a FedSoc group, uh, of your organization's mission statement. I could almost say it from memory. So, you know, the Federalist Society is founded on the principles that, and here's the very first principle that's listed, the state exists to preserve freedom. The society seeks to reorder priorities within the legal system to place a premium on individual liberties. Well, way back in 1994, almost 30 years ago now, I was on a FedSoc panel with one of your distinguished founding fathers, Irving Kristol. Uh, following my custom, I opened my remarks by reciting these libertarian tenets of your group, and that sent him into a state of shock. Uh, <laughs> literally, our discussion was published in the Harvard Journal of Law and Public Policy, so let me read you his exact response. I am shocked to discover that the Federalist Society seems to have said somewhere that the state exists to preserve freedom. 
the Federal Society should call a meeting immediately and change that. <laughs> you say that and you get yourself in the kind of trap that Ms. Strassen has now sprung. <laughs> since, since then, before every FedSoc speaking engagement, I reread your website to make sure you have not heeded Irving Crystal's advice, and so far you have not done that. Um, therefore, to quote Mr. Crystal, you are again trapped by your own words when it comes to today's topic. And I say that with a smile because it is an organization of conservatives and libertarians. And I do think that uh, preservation of freedom can well be understood as a conservative principle as well as a libertarian and civil libertarian one. Um, so that brings me to my second introductory point, and that is just as too many liberals are insufficiently critical of or even support speech suppression that results from progressive cancel culture, including on campus, too many conservatives are insufficiently critical of or even support speech suppression that results from state laws that restrict discussion of the very same topics, namely race and gender based on the very same rationales, namely that these topics are divisive and make people uncomfortable. So I want to make a personal plea uh, to each and every one of you important members of this important audience. Please bring to bear the same critical perspective you rightly have toward woke cancel culture, also toward all other speech suppression efforts, certainly including government measures that have at least the same speech suppressive impact, if not worse. Uh, I know that FedSoc as an organization doesn't take positions on contested public policy issues. Most people don't know that, but I do. Uh, but each of you can do so as an individual and should do so, especially given your important and influential voices as lawyers and judges and as leading members of your communities. Uh, it's so easy to defend freedom for the thought that we love, but those cherished thoughts that we love won't continue to be free unless enough of us also advocate freedom for the thought that we hate. Um, and again, ever since its founding, the spirit of FedSoc has been uh, to nurture debate and different perspectives, and I see that as very much a testament to, to free speech. Um, so in fact, uh, I, not in your lawyer's brochure, but in your student uh, brochure, I am so proud that a testimonial I gave to FedSoc shortly after it was founded is still there, featured on the first inside page, and my old sparring partner, Nino, is only on the next page, but who's counting? <laughs> um, um, but in all seriousness, you know, we can't take this kind of forum for granted, and I I think it's one of the reasons why uh, FedSoc is now so embattled in a, in, on a, in a campus culture that no longer prizes bringing together diverse perspectives. Look what happened at Yale Law School just um, a few weeks ago. Uh, I'll get to the details of that later. I'd like to refer to two important pieces on point. Um, the first one is by uh, four authors. Uh, it was in the New York Times last summer, and uh, here's the headline. We disagree on a lot of things except the danger of anti-critical race theory laws. And the four authors were uh, a progressive, a moderate, a libertarian, the conservative. The conservative is David French, um, very esteemed writer, very devout Christian, as well as um, conservative. And um, all of them, some of them very, could not agree, disagree more strongly with critical race theory on the merits or from their perspective demerits. But what they all agreed on is that the laws that are being passed with the alleged goal of you know, not allowing indoctrination in critical race theory actually are written in such a way that they're completely antithetical to freedom of speech. So even 
even David French and you know all of the other authors here um, uh, strongly oppose those laws, and I think that's a respectable uh, position all across the ideological spectrum. The second piece I'd actually like to um, read a couple of brief passages. It's written by uh, my fellow liberal Jonathan Zimmerman, who is one of the few of us, sadly, uh, who continues to rail against uh, uh, violations of free speech and other illiberalism that's coming from our end of the political spectrum. Um, the title of the piece says it all. It's a, a phrase that many of you may have heard before. Unfortunately, it reflects what is true for most people. Uh, they support, quote, free speech for me, but not for thee. And Jonathan starts his piece by saying, um, you're a Republican. You rage about cancel culture on college campuses, but you champion state laws that would limit teaching about race in our K-12 schools. You're a Democrat. You condemn the GOP-sponsored measures to suppress instruction in schools, but you support, or at least accept, the restriction of speech at colleges and universities. Um, that was his introduction, and here's his conclusion. I once read that the only way two sides can settle a dispute is for both of them to admit that they're wrong. So I've got a modest proposal. Conservatives will agree to stop censoring K-12 schools on the condition that liberals stop censoring higher education. That means letting our teachers and students in public schools discuss race freely without worrying that they might be breaking the law. But it also means allowing everyone at colleges and universities to question the dominant campus ethos around race and everything else. You either believe in free speech or you don't. And you can't demand it for yourself if you're denying it to someone else. And this was a theme that came through a lot in Jonathan's excellent presentation. Um, now, turning to the campus cancel culture, it's certainly gotten a tremendous amount of uh, publicity. Uh, again, the critique is coming mostly from the conservative end of the spectrum. I bemoan the fact that the uh, mainstream liberal media is just not paying as much attention to this problem as it should. I don't know why, because if you look at where the cancel culture pressures are coming from on campus, they are coming from the right on some campuses as well as from the left on some campuses. And some people who are being canceled or attempted to be canceled are on the left uh, as well as on the right. A, a major um, uh, assessment uh, was uh, based on a, a, a thorough report that was done by FIRE, the Foundation for Individual Rights in Education. And um, a discussion of that was recently published in the Daily Beast by Greg Lukianoff, who's the CEO of FIRE, and Comey German. Uh, who also works for FIRE. And uh, the title of their excellent article was um, Don't Stop Using the Term Cancel Culture. That's because, as you know, especially from the woke progressive end of the spectrum, there's a lot of disparagement of the term. And one of the um, uh, citations in support of, oh, that's so exaggerated, is uh, the example that was given of Vladimir Putin trying to somehow wrap himself in the ma mantle of cancel culture. As Greg and Kobe rightly say, the fact that some people are abusing the term or misusing it doesn't deprive it of its core meaning and public opinion polls show we all know what is being talked about um, and uh, the statistics are really quite alarming fire especially I'm just going to look at, at campus recognizing there are other venues where this plays out also recognizing that the number of reported incidents are just the tip of the iceberg right for each incident that is reported there are countless others that never see the light of day uh, so FIRE has meticulously uh, gathered the statistics, which show, as reported in this Daily Beast piece, that since 2015, there have been uh, 563 reported incidents. The majority do come from the left, 345 from the left, but 202 are coming from the right. That's not uh, any small matter. Since the year 2020, I mean, the numbers are just dramatically escalating. Since 2020, the number of reported incidents is 283. And just so you understand the significance, you know, when I say an incident, I'm not talking about something trivial. Uh, I mean, sorry, I shouldn't say trivial, but something 
relatively minor, such as, let's say, a student being kicked off a social uh, a chat group. And I know if you're a student, that's hardly trivial. I don't mean to demean that. Uh, but just to put that in context, here's one statement from the article. When Greg joined FIRE in 2001, the idea of one tenured professor for being fired for protected speech seemed impossible. Yet since 2015, 30 tenured professors have been fired for engaging in constitutionally protected speech. So, you know, these incidents are, have the most enormous consequence in terms of being the, you know, utter violations of notions of free speech and academic freedom. And each one of them, of course, has innumerable ripple effects in terms of the pervasive chilling and self-censorship that everybody is reporting on campus across all demographic groups and across all ideological groups, faculty members as well as students. I, I, I see something interesting um, in recent surveys, which is particularly relevant to an organization partially consisting of conservatives along with the libertarians. Um, and that is the Knight Institute, which periodically has done surveys of self-censorship on campus um, in its most recent survey a few months ago, again concluded that everybody is self-censoring on these super important topics of race and gender. And some self-censorship is fine. I mean, if you were gonna say something insulting, you probably, going back to this concept of courtesy, <coughs> you probably should phrase your idea in a non-insulting way, right? So that kind of self-censorship we call editing or um, courtesy. Uh, but the kind of self-censorship we're talking about is when not only entire perspectives are not voiced at all, but entire subjects aren't discussed at all. And these are the subjects that are so critically important, uh, namely race and gender. So everybody is self-censoring. But there were two groups that were self-censoring more than others. One group was black students, and the other group was conservative students. And I thought, that's so interesting. And I've mentioned it in my constant talks uh, on campus, including to FedSoc groups, that you know this is a natural sort of alliance between the, the FedSoc and maybe the campus Republicans or other conservative groups and the Black Law Students Association and other minority student groups, that you have a, a common special interest in making sure that every person is equally empowered and encouraged to participate in campus discussions uh, in the classroom, outside of the classroom, no matter who you are and no matter what you believe. Um, okay, I wanted to say something about law schools because this was the last crumbling as far as I'm concerned um, and spilling over into the legal profession. We were the last defense uh, against the depredations of cancel culture as recently as and I'm putting it in the past tense, as you well know the reasons why. But as recently as, as 2018, um, uh, Heather Gerken, who had then just become the first female dean of the Yale Law School, wrote a piece in Time Magazine in which she was, you know, very understandably proud about the fact that even though we had all these other cancellation events on other segments of the campus, including Yale itself, uh, deplatforming and shaming and shunning and, and so forth, that there had not been any incidents at a law school at all until that point. And Heather Gerken uh, said, this is because of the legal culture, because of the professional norms that, that Jonathan talked about, the ABA model rules, that lawyers understand you can't, you can't be a lawyer, you can't be trained as a lawyer, unless you are steeped in all perspectives on all issues and are devil's advocate. Uh, even for positions that you don't agree with, and the kind of professional courtesy. Uh, she gave a very stirring example that Thurgood Marshall, uh, at a time when there was deep segregation in Jim Crow in states where he was practicing, that he was still treated with respect in the courts of law. He got, got away with cross-examining white people, which would have been completely anathema 
in any other context, but the professional norms were so strong that they overcame even the entrenched uh, Jim Crow in that limited but significant respect. Well, how, how, how much things have deteriorated since 2018, including on, uh, at Yale Law School itself, where um, the incidents are, are you have been well publicized, so I don't want to take time reciting them. But um, let me just say from a personal perspective, Yale is one of many schools that illustrate the demonization that has occurred against the Federalist Society. I've spoken to your national leaders about this. I speak to the students about it. Uh, but it's really heartbreaking, and I can see because the students are so earnest and they are so dedicated to, um, to dialogue and discussion and diverse perspectives. I don't know if you know that some of you may have been active in the um, campus FedSoc groups when you were in law school, but uh, the national FedSoc does require, what I think the students would do on their own anyway, that they always have, at least try very hard to have, uh, at least two different perspectives re represented in every single program. Also, that they always have, or at least try very hard to have, co-sponsorship with other student organizations of different perspectives, including preeminently, since it was founded, the American Constitution Society, but minority student groups and the women's student groups, et cetera, et cetera. And that was never a problem. Uh, until a couple of years ago. I can't tell you how many uh, events I've spoken at, and if the FedSoc was the initial inviter, it was always co-sponsored by ACS and a host of others, and vice versa. That started to change. Uh, I heard reports that it was changing after 2016. We know the benchmarks here. Um, in my own personal experience, it didn't change until after January 6th. Uh, and I can date exactly when, you know, I'd heard reports that there were some speakers and some events who were being boycotted, but you know, I'm, I'm a bleeding heart liberal after all of these years. It would seem very odd for me to be boycotted, even if, and you would think that FedSoc would be lauded for bringing me to campus. Uh, it was on Lincoln's birthday last year. So, you know, nice coincidence of timing in this, in this venue. I was invited to speak at Duke Law School. The only other speaker was another liberal free speech advocate deliberately invited by um, FedSoc because of the troubles that it had been having. Uh, that was Greg Lukianoff, the CEO of FIRE, Foundation for Individual Rights in Education. And we were speaking about civil discourse on campus. And we didn't get shut down or shouted down, um, but we got boycotted. Not a single other student organization would sponsor it, not the student ACS, not the student ACLU. And Greg had also worked for the ACLU. I thought you were the president. <laughs> I mean, you know, I defend their free speech rights to engage in this kind of activity, but I raise my voice to, to protest, uh, as I do defend the right to engage in boycotts, but urge that they are not healthy for the kind of free speech culture uh, we are seeking to nurture. And, I, and, and uh, individual students, it was heartbreaking. Uh, reached out to me and said, you know, we really want to come because we're really interested in this topic, uh, but we're afraid that we're going to be ostracized and stigmatized if we even attend a Federalist Society event. And some of them were liberals who were active in ACS, and they said, we're never going to get a leadership position in ACS if we are even seen attending this. So can we please email you after the event? Um, you know, and there, there are many other examples. One at Yale that uh, got quite a bit of publicity was um, Trap House when uh, Trent Colbert, an astoundingly brave student who had, it was also, he was a leader of the Fed SOC on campus and also of the Native American uh, Law Students Association. He's Cherokee by background. Um, he used this term, trap house, I'm sorry, I should have given you a trigger warning, uh, uh, be, no, because I've learned it, it has a racial connotation originally, not a racist, but racial is, is its origin, and so 
um, the Yale bureaucrats, deans, called him in, and he had the temerity not only to stand up to their bullying, but to video record all of it. And they actually, and they were trying to compel him to sign an apology, which they had written out. Um, and they said they would go a little bit easier on him because he was Native American. But on the other hand, the fact that he was with Fedsock cut the other way because we know that Fedsock is misogynistic and racist. And um, so, uh, ten, ten oh, so, 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 sorry, so I have to, I have to, yeah. I have to wrap this up. Uh, let me just uh, skip to one other example mm -hmm. because um, I think it's the ultimate so far. At Emory Law School, after a lot of horrible incidents uh, violating free speech, students tried to form an organization called the Emory Free Speech Forum. Now, the Student Government Association there has the power to decide which student groups are authorized. They denied the request for this organization to be formed, not once, but twice. Why? Because free speech is divisive and makes people uncomfortable. I'm gonna end on a positive note, what we can do. Now, this is not what you think it is. <laughs> and for those of you who read it, it doesn't say make America great again, it says make J.S. Mill great again. <laughs> I, and I think, but in truth, you can't make America great again without making J.S. Mill great again. So thanks to all of you for your contributions. <laughs> Let's just do audience questions. Thank you very much. I'm still going to give you that gift membership. I think. <laughs> so uh, we have 10 minutes for, for questions. We were going to try to do it intra uh, panel, but let's take them from the audience instead. Yeah. Uh, yes, sir. Up front. John? with the mic, I guess I can sit. Um, uh, the, uh, the judge uh, was interested in my examples from Chicago recently of uh, educators wanting to change the name of Daniel Boone Public School because he once owned five slaves. That was during the time of light when he wasn't a captive of the Native Americans, of course. And then uh, with the University of Illinois acquiring the John Marshall Law School, a long-standing private law school, saying, now that we've acquired it, we're changing the name. We can't have the slave owner's name tarnish uh, the reputation of the school. Um, on this entire cancel culture initiative, it's my view, and I'd like your opinion, uh, just uh, riffing off the, uh, the laws of thermodynamics, once you eliminate something, something that you can't have in a vacuum, something has to take its place. I think on the, the Daniel Boone and Cape Girardeau incidents and, and uh, John Marshall, the idea is to supplant that with a more, let's say, broadly anti-American historical uh, narrative for the country. You know, maybe someday there'll be statues to Eugene Debs, some of these minor early socialist folks in America. I think in the New Deal, the Federal Writers Project, there was promotion of a leftist and a socialist history of America. I see that coming, do you agree or not? Then on the social side, um, I actually, my view is that we're going towards in, uh, incoherence. It's an attack on the traditional family and what is filling the vacuum, I don't even understand. It's incoherent, it's self-conflicting, doesn't make any sense. You know, we have the result of a, you know, a, a gender affiliating prisoner in a female prison, impregnating, impregnating a female prisoner. So we're trending towards incoherence. So I'd like your reactions to those observations. Thank you. You seem to be looking at me, is that correct? Or other? Well, you know, uh, let, uh, let, me, uh, let me share with you, I had a heated discussion with the executive director of the ACLU in Chicago many years ago on national security. And he specifically referenced the Palmer raids of 1919, and it was, it was meant to be anti-Semitic. So there's a strain on the left of an alternative history of America that's always been there, frankly. I think we'll take that as a comment. Yeah, all right. Back in the back, you. yep. Hi, so Illinois recently passed, passed what they call an inclusive education bill that basically says that some LGBT history has to be taught to people before they graduate eighth grade. If in the future a different Illinois administration tried to repeal that bill or change the law in a way that would remove that from the curriculum, would you see that as cancel culture? 
and what constitutes a change in a way that you would see as closing or canceling as opposed to uh, just people asserting their rights over public schools and parental decisions over what the school should be teaching? I'm happy to yield to my other panelists, but um, since I'm on the education spot, I think you know the public school situation is very delicate in the sense that, rightly, uh, community values are expected to be reflected in the curriculum. My bottom line is this, that every subject can be taught in an indoctrinating way. You could even teach free speech in an indoctrinating way. And conversely, every subject can be taught in a way and must be taught in a way that develops critical thinking and inquiry. So I'd say uh, we should focus much more on making sure about, uh, that the underlying values of critical thinking, analysis, questioning, multiple perspectives are being ingrained in our students, regardless of what the subject matter is. Yes, sir. This is a follow-up for Professor Strassen, and forgive me if I misunderstand your point, but do you equate censorship of public school curriculum directed at a captive audience of children with censorship of college curriculum directed at consenting adults? It's not completely the same, but there actually are free speech rights that the Supreme Court has recognized in the school context. Um, and I've written a long law review article about that, which I would be happy to share with you. But you're absolutely right that the constitutional challenges are going to be easier at the university level. Way in the back. Again, for Professor Strassen, kind of a theme going along here. Um, Zoom classes revealed content. And um, the the content being exposed to parents created questions. And um, I'm wondering what your feeling is. The, what, what's arisen from those questions has been legislation, anti-CRT, don't say gay, yada, yada, yada. But the, there seems to be an imbalance of power and influence over curriculum that was only revealed through these Zoom classes. And parents may not feel they have the ability or the strength to push back not just against academia, uh, by the publishers, but against academia and teachers' unions. So completely agreeing with your point that we have ourselves as federalists have to be careful about the desire to use the power of government to combat that. When you're up against the influence of teachers' unions and academia, what choices are left? Well, again, you know, the devil is in the details. And the goals, as said in that uh, New York Times piece that I cited, may be admirable from your perspective and from my perspective. But if you look at how these laws are written, they are so overly broad and so vague. And we see, that's not just theoretical. You see how teachers and librarians have been reacting in, in schools around the country, uh, removing from the curriculum you know, books that are really important in terms of history, in terms of uh, literature, because they are so afraid, understandably, of being accused of uh, child abuse and, and violating the law. Uh, possibly a law could be written that is more um, that, it, that is more narrowly tailored, that would provide a, a, a means to, um, to further critical inquiry rather than, than shutting it down. But that hasn't happened that goes, yet. That goes both ways, the, the canceling of Mark Twain's books, yeah, for instance. Exactly. I agree it's with that. It's not just one way. It's, it's exactly right. The librarians have a tough job these days. Yeah. Yeah. So, can, can I just add a brief observation yeah. on this? It's a little bit outside the scope of the panel, but I think, you know, I'm, I'm far from an expert on education, but I think what the last couple of years and all these battles and everything have shown to me is that we have got to get the government out of the education business, right? Like, I, like I share your skepticism with regulations of school speech, but the, only, the choice we have, the policy choice, is to give parents dollars that they can vote with, and you decide what your kids learn, right? Do, do, do people know that J.S. Mill uh, actually wrote that public schools are inherently violative of individual rights because it results in government indoctrination? Yeah, there's just no way to teach these subjects with that, in a non-value-laden way, and so those choices should be made by parents with their dollars, not, not the government. Okay, one last question, way in the back. 
uh, to the two right of center panelists. Uh, <laughs> and uh, I don't think I heard either of you talk about this, but forgive me if I uh, missed it. So it's not okay to cancel Lincoln, but what about um, Jeff Davis, Beauregard, Alexander Stevens? Can we quote unquote cancel them? And here's the argument maybe why, because there's a difference between them and George Washington and Thomas Jefferson. Thomas Jefferson and George Washington, they were born into a system that they didn't create, and we celebrate them for the achievements they made, right, to, to progress away from that, uh, the, the shortcomings of that system into which they were born. And there's a huge difference uh, between that and individuals who committed their lives to perpetuating two evils, one constitutional evil, secession, and the other a moral evil, slavery. Uh, so is it wrong to cancel Secessionists, the, the Southerners, the uh, who seceded in the Civil War uh, in order to perpetuate slavery. Professor Anders, Walker. So I, I wrestle with this all the time. I teach I teach U.S. U.S. history to undergraduates at St. Louis University, and it is uh, tough to sit in front of a group of students and talk about a bunch of old white guys when none of my students are old white guys, and so I think we constantly revise and rewrite history. And what I've learned after two books that didn't sell <laughs> is it's the reader that writes history. The readers will go and the books that they want to read are going to become the history that we have. And so we have a new, the more diverse we get, the more, more multicultural, multilingual, multiracial, the more our history is going to have to evolve because otherwise they're just going to lose interest. I mean, I have students falling asleep in class at SLU. It doesn't matter what you're teaching. They're not listening, and they're not reading. And so the, my job is to write something that will captivate the reader. And it, the audience is driving it, just like the audience or the consumer drives the market. And so that's something I wrestle with, and I'm wrestling with right now, trying to get a, a, a book sold, is who cares? about Andrew Jackson. <laughs> okay, I, our time's up. Please give a hand to our illustrious panelists. <laughs>